When I was in high school, I was considering what I want to do with my life, right? That's the time you ask those kind of questions. Middle schoolers, high schoolers asking those questions. What do you want to do with your life? And, and, and there were a few things. Ministry was one of those things. But um, another one was audio engineering. I wanted to be an audio technician to do what Mark is doing behind the soundboard right now. thought it would be cool to travel around uh, on tours with, with maybe with a Christian band, one of the bands that I liked, and, 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 and to run sound and, and, and enjoy music and these things that are so life-giving to me. And when I was in college, I had an opportunity to do some of that, not a lot of touring, but a little bit, um, and travel around with, uh, with a group that I, uh, a worship group that I knew. And, uh, and I quickly came to realize, as I was with uh, some, uh, some of the other people who were in the industry, uh, that there was, this was a job that cost quite a lot. I knew a little bit about what the job entailed and, and, and the fun stuff about it, but I didn't know uh, what it would cost me. Yeah, what it would be like to be on the road for a week, away from family, away from community, living out of a suitcase for a majority of my days. And I realized that this, this job, I really hadn't fully counted the cost. I knew a little bit about what this job called audio engineer was about, but I didn't fully understand what that calling would require me to give up, it would require sacrifice, a denial of certain things that I wasn't ready to give up. Most any job or anything that we do in life costs us something, doesn't it? Just by the very virtue that we're doing this and not another thing, there are things that we have to give up. Even in the Christian life, we're in the season of Lent now, a time when we remind ourselves that being a Christian has certain things that we have to give up in order to really follow Jesus. Uh, maybe some of you have given something up for Lent before. Can you shout out, what are some things that you've given up for Lent? Chocolate, anyone? What else? What else? Ice cream. Ice cream. Anybody else? Facebook. Candy. Sugar. That was one that I did one year. It didn't go so well. Any, anybody else? Sleep. Sleep? Really? Interesting. All right. Some people might fast on a certain day in, in, in Lent. Um, th- these, these things um, that, uh, that we give up remind us that there is a denial that's required when we want to follow Jesus. What we're talking about today is more than just giving something up for a period of 40 days. It's, this is a denial, a sacrifice that comes with calling ourselves Christians. It's part of the job, so to speak. And it's what Jesus is talking about in our gospel text for today. A little bit of background for you. The couple verses before what uh, Larry read for us today, Jesus is walking around with his disciples and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And and the disciples say, well, you know, some some people say that you're John the Baptist. Uh, Some people say that you're, you're Elijah, still others, one of the other prophets. And Jesus presses them further, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up the spokesperson for the, for the disciples. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the anointed one. The one who's come to set us free from oppression. The one who's come to bring God's people back to him. You are the Messiah. Peter answers correctly. He knows what to call Jesus. He and the disciples both. But then Jesus starts to teach them some hard things. It's right where our text picks up for today. The Son of Man must suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the whole religious establishment. He's going to be killed. And after three days, he's going to rise again. It's not what the disciples expected him to say after they knew what to call him. You're the Messiah. They expected triumph. They expected victory. They expected glory. They expected the good life for Jesus and for them as as his followers and for all God's people. So Peter, maybe feeling a little high on his horse because he got one answer wrong, pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. Not a good idea. You think that Peter would second guess himself, but he doesn't. Mark doesn't tell us what he said, but we can make some assumptions. Jesus, what are you talking about? You're not going to die. You're going to reign on high forever. You're the Messiah. You're, you're, You're the one that we've been waiting for. Don't talk about rejection. Don't talk about suffering and death. Let's do whatever we need to protect you because you're the Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed one of God. Jesus listens to what he has to say and then he he looks over his shoulder at the other disciples and he addresses Peter in front of all of them and he says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on God's interests. 
You're setting your mind on human interests. Pretty strong language, huh? The only time in Scripture that a human being is called Satan, the the, the accuser, the, the name that's used for the devil himself. What's going on here? Jesus sees the reality that's behind what Peter's saying. When Peter rebukes Jesus, he's not just trying to correct Jesus, but he's pushing against what God is trying to do in this situation. Peter has totally misunderstood the will of God for his anointed one, for his Messiah. Peter might have known Jesus' title. He might have known what to call Jesus, but he clearly didn't understand Jesus' calling. He didn't understand what God had sent him to do. He didn't understand the way that Jesus' Messiahship would unfold. And in fact, Peter gets it so wrong that his words are a manifestation of Satan himself. Satan opposes the work of God. That's what Satan does. He's the adversary. He's the one who pushes against God's will, who stands against God's kingdom, who tries to derail God's plan. He's the one who tempted Jesus in the wilderness, right? To try to set it all off track. Get behind me, Satan. Peter says, no, Jesus, this isn't going to happen to you. You're the Messiah. Jesus says, your vision of what the Messiah is, of who the Messiah has called to be, is so diametrically opposed to God's will that it's satanic. For me to be that Messiah, the Messiah that you want me to be, would be to fall to Satan's temptations. For Jesus to be the Messiah means that he will suffer and he will die and he will rise again on the third day. There's no other way to slice it. That's just how it goes. It's the way that God intended it. Jesus is saying, Peter, don't you know, you can't have the Messiah without suffering. You don't want the Messiah without suffering. The world can't be saved without the cross and the resurrection. You can't get to the kingdom without going through Good Friday and coming on through on the other side to Easter Sunday. I think it's kind of like trying to make pizza without tomato sauce and cheese. My wife Elena is allergic to both tomato sauce, not, not, not raw tomatoes, but tomato sauce, um, and dairy, so that rules out cheese, right? So when we try to make pizza at our house without tomato sauce and cheese, I don't know what you call it, maybe like flatbread, but it's not pizza, right? Right? Uh, it, whatever you want to call it, it's not pizza, Jesus is saying a Messiah without the death and resurrection might be a military leader or a political revolutionary, but he's not the anointed one of God. Any other way of being Messiah, of saving God's people, any road that I might take to avoid that suffering, death and resurrection is contrary to the will of God. You can't call it the Messiah. And then Jesus gathers the crowd in too to speak to all of them together. Because if his disciples, the people who knew him the best, who had traveled around with him, who knew him better than anybody else did, who knew enough to call him the Messiah, if they didn't understand Jesus' calling, you better bet that the rest of them didn't understand either. And if they didn't understand Jesus' calling, then they certainly can't understand their calling. They're following this Messiah, and their calling depends on his calling. Jesus doesn't want them to be unprepared for where he is calling them to go. Jesus wants them to see that because he must suffer and die, that's the language he uses, his followers also must suffer and be rejected. Jesus doesn't want anybody to be confused about what they're signing up for. And so Jesus says this, and this is the heart of what I want to say this morning. If anyone wants to be my follower... If anyone wants to be my follower, that person must deny himself, take up her cross, and follow me. Deny yourself to set aside those things, those thoughts, those priorities that get in the way of following Jesus. Take up your cross. This is not just a call to suffering in general. Let me say this, because we use this phrase, don't we? Uh, Well, I guess this is just my cross to bear. When hardship comes our way. But Jesus is talking about something specific here. The cross is a symbol of suffering. And it's also a symbol of shame and rejection. Jesus is calling us to pick up our cross. He's calling us to follow him so radically. that So fully identifying with him. That we're willing to do so even to the point of death. Even to the point of rejection by the world. Even to the point of shame and suffering. 
Carrying our cross is, is when being a Christian, the way that we follow Jesus, puts our lives at risk or our, our pride or, or whatever else because we're following Jesus. That's what carrying our cross looks like. And follow me, Jesus says, wherever he may go, wherever he may lead, to follow him all the way. And then Jesus takes it one step further. He says this is actually, in fact, a matter of life and death. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what benefit is, is it for a person to gain the whole world yet forfeit his life? What can a person give in exchange for their life? Now, the NIV translation uses the word soul, but that oftentimes makes us think of some sort of spiritual inner part of us that somehow uh, flies away after we die, right? Uh, but, but the sense here is, is really the center of ourself, the core of who we are, our, our identity in, in this world, our, our in, the core of our individual existence in this world, the soul of our life. That is what we lose when we try to hold on to it. You think you're holding on to your life by playing it safe, by, by, by rebuking Jesus when he talks about suffering and death, by, by looking for that path that's going to lead to life. Well, you're not. You're going to lose it. If we only follow Jesus up to a point, up to the point where it gets dangerous, up to the point where we're risking something, we're actually not saving our life at all. The opposite is, is in fact the case. If we grasp at our life, if we cling to our lives, if we're unwilling to die for Jesus' sake and for the gospel, then we lose that very thing that we are trying to save. We lose our life. And if we lose our life, what can we possibly give to get it back? Jesus asks nothing. Once you've sold out, you've sold out. We often try to soften this passage, I think, to make it a metaphor about giving up material possessions or comfort or other things like that. And I think it is about those things. But before we go there, let us hear it the way that the disciples probably heard it. Jesus was not talking about losing your life in some sort of metaphorical sense. Jesus was talking about literal death. These disciples knew that following Jesus could very well get them killed. If, as he said a few verses earlier, Jesus is on a head-on collision course with all the religious establishment, then they, as his disciples, following him, they're headed to that place as well. Now fast forward to the end of the first century. According to tradition, all but two of the disciples would die because of their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. All but two would literally deny themselves and literally lose their lives for Jesus' sake. And some in some very horrific ways. Beatings, crucifixions, literally taking up their cross. Beheadings. This tells us that even though the disciples might not have gotten it in this moment... They eventually really got it. And they eventually incorporated this teaching into the core of their lives so much so that they gave up everything for Jesus. This is true discipleship. This is dangerous discipleship, but it's true discipleship. The true Christian calling. Not trying to get around, uh, or not, it's not that we try to run around getting ourselves killed or anything like that, but to so radically live for Jesus that we are willing to give up whatever God may call us to give up for the sake of the gospel. Today in the United States, most of us don't know the risk of actually losing our lives because we follow Christ. But there are Christians in our world who do. And in fact, persecution has been getting worse globally over the last couple of years. Talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ from China, from Egypt, Eritrea, India, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, North Korea, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Sudan uh, Syria, and Turkey, and other places in the world as well. Following Jesus in these places may truly lead to losing your life. We're not so aware of this in our daily lives, are we? We should be. We do well to hold the global body of Christ up in prayer and, 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 and to care for them and to find ways to stand in solidarity with them. But the bottom line here is that Jesus had no, he had no expectation that following him was safe. 
Has anyone ever told you that following Jesus is dangerous? That making a decision to follow Christ could, could lead you to lose absolutely everything? Could cause you to lose your very life? That's exactly what Jesus is saying to the disciples here. And the crowds who are considering following him, he wants them to count the cost now before they get down the road and discover that they can't go all the way. This week I was listening to a sermon that uh, Brenda Salter McNeil gave at Quest Church in Seattle. Some of you may know uh, Brenda Salter McNeil is an associate pastor there at Quest Covenant Church. Um, She's an author on racial reconciliation and the gospel, highly sought after preacher and teacher. This sermon, she was talking about an experience she had in seminary. She went to Fuller. They have a world mission center there. So people from all over the globe come to study. And she was talking with a couple of her friends uh, about evangelism one day. Both of these friends were from Singapore. She was commenting on how much she loved the evangelism that she grew up with uh, in in, in the black church, the the altar calls. And let's, if you want to follow Christ, come on down right now. Let's do it here. And now let's not waste a moment because following Christ is so important. And one of her friends said, you know, that's, that's actually not how evangelism works in Singapore. And in fact, if somebody came up to us after hearing the gospel for the first time and told us that they wanted to commit their life to Christ, we would tell them to go home. Go home and think about it. And really weigh the cost of this decision that you are about to make. Because following Jesus is going to cost you something. In fact, it may cost you everything. Maybe even your life. Now you may say to me, but Jesus, Jesus said he came to give us life, didn't he? An abundant life. Isn't this what we believe? It's even on the cover of our bulletins. And it's true. Jesus has come to offer us abundant life. But the way to that abundant life is the road that leads to the cross. This is one of the greatest paradoxes of the Christian faith and one that I think we need to place at the center of our lives. Jesus says that you have to die to live. You have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him wherever he may lead, even to death. And and it's in this following Jesus all the way, all the way to the cross, that we find that abundant, eternal life in God's presence, and even here and now, that he offers us. That's why we sang the song, Lead Me to the Cross Together. Lead me to the cross, God. Lead me to your heart. God, give us what we need to follow you all the way. To follow you even to those uncomfortable places. Those places that are going to cost me more than I want to give up. God, lead me there. and Oh God, give me the strength. Give me the strength to follow you even there. The way Jesus talks to his disciples, cross-carrying isn't optional. Cross-carrying isn't optional. This isn't the difference between being an overachieving Christian on the one hand and being a sort of kind of Christian on the other, right? This isn't the the difference between being a seriously committed 24-7 follower of Jesus and a I do it on the weekends follower of Jesus, right? This is a question of are you or aren't you? Are you or aren't you a follower of Christ? Dietrich Bonhoeffer In his classic, The Cost of Discipleship, he puts it this way. Just as Christ is Christ, only in virtue of his suffering and and, uh, rejection, so the disciple is a disciple only in so far as he or she shares in the Lord's suffering and rejection and crucifixion. Paul talks about this in in Philippians 3. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain from the resurrection to the dead. Friends, we can't get to Easter Sunday without going through Good Friday. We can't get to to the kingdom, to abundant life, to eternal life without going through the cross. That's where Christ went. And it's where he calls us to follow him. What we call Jesus, Messiah, And Jesus' calling and our own calling, all these things are interwoven. You can't pull them apart. You can't have the Messiah without the death and resurrection. And you can't be a Christian without denying yourself, following, or taking up your cross and following Jesus. Back to the pizza. What do you get when you take self-denial and cross-carrying out of the Christian life? 
you get a really, really nice person. Someone who's nice to a lot of people, but lives mostly for themselves. Pizza without sauce and cheese looks an awful lot like flatbread. And a Christian without self-denial and cross-carrying looks an awful lot like any other nice, moral person. What does real discipleship look like? Not just, I follow Jesus, I call myself a Christian, but I really embrace the calling that Jesus has placed on my life to follow him wherever he goes. I think Abraham and Sarah are a good example for us. God's call comes to Abraham out of the blue to leave his father's home, everything that he's known, and to leave for a place that God hasn't even told him where it is yet. He says, I'll show you when you get there. He leaves the safety and security of home for for, for the life of a nomad. He and Sarah, just because God has promised them, that's the only thing he has to go on. Just because God had promised and called them to follow him wherever he may lead them. In the passage that was read for us today, their names are even changed. Abram becomes Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. Their whole identity is shift. They have given up absolutely everything to follow God. Abraham, literally translated, means father of nations. Sarah, literally translated, means mother of nations. They aren't perfect. They make so many mistakes along the way. But they are faithful to follow wherever God leads them. And they give up their very lives, even their very own names, to take the calling that God has given them. We as Christians are called to follow the same path, to set our minds on God's interests, not on human interests. It's not enough to know what to call Jesus, Lord, Savior, Messiah. We need to know Jesus' calling because his calling shapes our calling. What's our calling? Jesus calls us to deny him, to deny ourselves. This Lent, let's give up more than chocolate or meat or sugar or sleep, whoever that was back there. Let's, let's deny that which really matters. Let's surrender anything that gets in the way of following Jesus. Denying our selfish ways of living, our plans, our priorities, our pride, our ambitions, and, and yes, our material possessions and, and our attachment to comfort, all of our privileged ways of living. Can we, can we deny these things, offer up everything that we have to God, our money, our marriage status, our time, our energy, even if it should come to this, even our very lives? Jesus calls us to pick up our cross to so identify with Jesus that that we risk running headlong into conflict with the ways of this world, even to the point of rejection and shame and suffering, even to the point of death. And Jesus calls him, us, Jesus calls us to follow him wherever he may go, wherever he may call, wherever he may lead, all the way to the cross and into eternal life as well. Praise God that he has not left us alone in this journey, huh? He has not left us alone. This is not something that we have to do on our own strength. Through his Holy Spirit, he has blessed us. He is with us. He is encouraging us, cheering us on, calling us forward, showing us the way. But the decision is still up to us. Will we follow? Will we find life abundant in him? Mark Twain says this. He says, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that, don't, that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that bother me. Isn't that the truth? This is painfully clear. Jesus makes it painfully clear for us. If anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, pick up her cross, and follow me. In another passage... Gospel of John, chapter 6. John gives his own uh, version of this encounter. Jesus is teaching the crowds, and and he's teaching these things that are really hard to understand and hard to live, too. He's talking about being the bread of heaven. He says, I am the bread of heaven, and and those who really want to follow me will eat my body and, and, and drink my blood. Jesus says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. John tells us that after this teaching, many of his disciples turned around. They went home. 
They counted the cost and they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They stopped following him. The teaching was too hard. The cost was too high. And Jesus turns to the 12 disciples and he says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else can we go? If we try to save our lives, we lose them. But if we give up our lives for the sake of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, then we find all that we need in him. And we can only find that in him. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Friends, let us follow Jesus. Follow him all the way into the cross and the resurrection. Let us find the abundant life, the abundant life that he has given us. May it be so. Amen.